All right, well, good morning, everyone. As we continue uh, looking into our series on the promised son, we will be taking a look today at Samson. Samson is a very prominent figure in the Old Testament, Judges chapter 13 through 16. Samson is a guy that we all know. He was super strong. It's pretty much where the myth Hercules came from, except Samson was uh, a real-life individual. God had set him apart even before he was conceived. The angel of the Lord came to Manoah and his wife and said, hey, you're going to have a son. He's going to be a Nazarite from before uh, basically throughout his whole life from the womb to death, and I'll explain what that is in a little bit. He's going to be super strong. He's going to begin to save my people from the enemy that is, that is raging against them. And so Samson is someone we know that was super strong physically, but he was actually an incredibly weak person morally and uh, spiritually speaking. And so Samson ultimately is going to point us towards someone so much greater. That's kind of like the point of Samson's life, is that yes, he was a promised son, uh, but he was not the serpent crusher that God had promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the one who God promised at the very beginning would come and destroy the serpent, destroy Satan. We thought this might be the guy. He wasn't the guy. We're looking for someone so much stronger than Samson. So today we're talking about Samson, the son of strength, and just like Isaac, again, he was a promised son. Samson was sworn to be born. Samson was set apart to live, and Samson was surrendered up to death. But before we actually go any further, I want to start by saying that Samson was a self-made mess. This is exactly who Samson was, as I just talked about. Samson sought to marry someone outside the faith, even though this was specifically and strictly prohibited in the book of Deuteronomy. You do not marry someone outside of the faith. You do not become unequally yoked with someone who is not a Christian, who is not like-minded in their faith. And the reason for that is because God said they, that unbeliever, that foreign nation, they will pull you away from me. They will cause you to pursue other gods. They will ruin your life, spiritually speaking. And so Samson did not really have any, or at least very little, regard for God's law. This is kind of a characteristic of Samson, not just in the, in the fact that he sought to marry someone outside the faith, but also because when he killed the lion, he just left the carcass there, and then later on he comes back kind of the same direction. Bees have come in. They've, they've made a whole honey hive, honeycomb, whatever you call it. And so he grabbed the honey and started eating it from the, dan the dead animal, and then he gave some to his parents, didn't tell them about it because he knew that, A, it actually goes against God's law. That breaks all sorts of cleanliness laws that God had for his people. So Samson sought to marry someone outside the faith. He also seemed to have very little regard for God's law. He had anger issues, and he frequently lost his temper. He abused animals and murdered people, specifically, uh, I think it was 300 foxes. He broke their tails, tied them together, lit them on fire, and uh, had them just go running through a, uh, a field of uh, wheat or something like that. I can't remember. But anyway, the point is he abused animals. This is not a good guy. This is not a guy to look up to. He abused animals. He murdered people. He hooked up with a prostitute while on a road trip. He lived with a woman who was not his wife. He was a habitual liar and a self-centered fool. And yet, in spite of all of this, God still chose to use him and even place him in the faith chapter. So if there's hope for this guy, there's hope for you. I just want you to be encouraged by that. Um, but the point is that, uh, yeah, this guy did not deserve to be in the faith chapter. Unlike Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Abel, like we look at all these other guys, Noah, like these are men of great faith. But the point then is that we kind of realize, hey, no one actually deserves to be in the faith chapter. The faith chapter is filled with a whole bunch of people that are only there because God chose to put them in there. And so ultimately, Samson did not deserve this honor, uh, but God gave it to him anyway. And so again, this is encouraging for me because I am myself a self-made mess. I would imagine that all of you are like me, also a self-made mess. Um, but the point is there that if God can use Samson, he can use everyone else. And so this, this tells us three incredibly important truths about Samson's life. Number one, if God can use Samson, God can use anyone. 
Number two, if God wanted to bless Samson, God wants to bless everyone. He literally wants to bless you. He wants to use you. He wants to work in you and through you in mighty ways. And number three, if Samson's life was this bad, then we know that he was, uh, we know he was meant to direct our attention to someone greater. Because ultimately, now, he's a promised son that we see in Scripture. God came to Manoah and his wife and said, hey, you're going to conceive, you're going to bear a son. I promise you, I'm swearing an oath, I'm going to give you this son, and he's going to begin to save my people from the enemy that they're facing. But Samson was a terrible person if we're actually looking at his life, which shows us that he's only there to point our attention to someone who's going to be a whole lot better than what Samson could ever be. And so today, we're talking about Samson again, the son of strength. Samson was sworn to be born. Samson was set apart to live. And Samson was surrendered up to death. This is Judges chapters 13 through 16. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we will uh, we'll begin with the message. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much that uh, you are a God who is gracious and merciful. Lord, none of us deserve uh, to be saved. None of us deserve to be used by you. None of us deserve to be in the faith chapter um, of all of eternity. And yet, for all of us who have placed our faith in Christ, for all of us who uh, have been saved from our sins, God, you, you, you choose willingly to honor each and every one of us, Father, and, and we love you so much. God, we don't deserve it, but you do it, any, and you do it anyway because you're gracious and kind. And, and the fact that you would use Samson uh, is really meant to be an encouragement to each and every one of us, Father. You want to use us. You want to bless us. You want to work in and through us, Father. And, and you, you never gave up on Samson, and you never give up on us either. And so, Father, I pray that we'd be encouraged as your people. I pray that you would help us to be, help us to be better than Samson. God, that we, as we are Christians, we're filled with your Holy Spirit. Father, that you would help us to live lives that are, um, that are strong in the faith. Help us to live lives that are, that are um, morally pure. Father, help us to be um, sons and daughters of the light, of the truth. Father, that we would be living as a contrast to the rest of the world. Father, I pray that you would just use us in mighty ways. I pray that you would guide us today as we walk through your word. And Lord, that you would just continue to bless us as your people. We love you in your name. Amen. So Judges chapters, chapter 13, verse 1 says, And the people of Israel, again, this word is uh, going to come up repeatedly in the book of Judges. Because again, Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So we're starting with a problem. Here is a very serious problem, a national problem. Israel is forsaking the Lord. They've turned their backs on him. And so we're starting out with a problem. Now, Judges 13, verse 2, next verse, there was a certain man of Zorah, so part of Israel here, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. So we start first with a national problem, and then we get into a personal problem. Manoah's wife was barren. Like, there was no hope. They were not having kids. They were barren. Uh, it, was, it was not coming about. And so not only does all hope seem lost outside in the rest of the world around them, but all hope seems lost in their own home. And what does God do here in the book of Judges? He promises to give them a son. In verse 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have, uh, and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. I give you my word. I'm making you this promise. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin... Uh, keep that word in your mind, because that's going to come up. He, he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So there are two problems. We have a national problem. Israel had forsaken the Lord. They had turned away from him, and we have a personal problem. This family, this couple, could not have children. It was just not happening. Nothing was coming through. And so God met both problems with a promise, which actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it. It's really neat, because there were religious groups within the nation of Israel, throughout Israel's history, even up until the time of Christ, that these religious leaders taught that it, basically Israel, and le, until you get your act together, 
until you are holy and righteous, until you start obeying the Sabbath and doing the right things and obeying the rules and regulations that we find in the Old Testament, until you basically are good enough, God's not going to send the Messiah uh, to, to come and redeem you, to come and rescue you. And so they were waiting for this, but they were ultimately waiting for the people to get their act together, not for the Lord to just fulfill his promise. And just in case you think that's a little weird, there are actually still Christian groups today um, who uh, some people, it's kind of a dying belief because of the world around us is not getting better. Um, but there are groups who believe in an idea that we'll talk about tonight at our last Sunday night study tonight for end times. But there are groups that believe in post-millennialism, which basically is that the, the church is going to Christianize the whole world. The whole world's going to get better. We're going to get our act together. And then Jesus will come back. But the problem with that is it's not reality. We don't actually see humanity ever getting better. It just doesn't happen that way. And it's not actually biblical. On the contrary, God shows up in the midst of catastrophe. He shows up at the very worst time, the darkest time imaginable, so that his light will shine brighter than ever before, so that all can see it very clearly. That's pretty much the consistent theme, all right? We have a, we have a point in Israel's history in the book of Judges, dark time in Israel's history, and what does God do? He promises a son. God shows up. Darkest point in, human his, uh, in, in Israel's history was the time of the Judges. Then we get, all the way now, a thousand plus years later, we get to the time of Christ, very dark time in Israel's history. The religious leaders have gone rogue. They pr completely left the faith for their own tradition. They're burdening the people with all of these laws and requirements that aren't actually in God's word. They're just oppressing and enslaving the people of Israel. Um, and, and there are corrupt leaders left and right. I mean, Herod is ruling over, over this district. Herod is known for killing People in his own family, the Roman emperor even said it, it was safer to be uh, Herod's pig than his own son because Herod just had this great fear that everyone in his family was going to rise up and assassinate him, and so he would just kill people. I mean, these were people who were ruling, and they were in the government at that time. And so we have a very dark time in Israel's history, and what happens? God shows up. So we actually see the exact opposite. God is not waiting on us to get our act together. God is going to fulfill his promise, probably at the darkest time in human history. It's called a rescue mission for a reason. He's coming in to rescue his people. He's not waiting us for us to just roll out the carpet. He's going to rescue his people. Uh, Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, tells us this. It talks about this great apostasy that is coming on the whole world, that we are beginning to experience, all right? A great apostasy like never before, when churches all over the world begin to leave the faith for things that just tickle their ears. Oh, I love that. You know, in the last days, people will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They will be easily offended, something that has risen exponentially over the last few years, offended at everything. Um, they'll be greedy, dishonorable, uh, disloyal to their spouses, immoral, uh, disobedient to parents, their hearts will grow cold, they'll tattle on you if you're not wearing a mask, you know, like different things like that, like basically the world just falls into complete chaos, perfect opportunity for God to come through, for God to then step in and rescue his people, and so what do we see here? We see in the book of Judges at this point, the night is darkest just before the dawn, this famous quote uh, that has been uh, put in movie after movie after movie. People have said it all over social media. The night is darkest just before the dawn. This really is kind of the consistent theme throughout Scripture. And there are three things to remember here. The dawn is coming. I mean, every night does get pretty dark, but ultimately the sun does rise up. The, the dawn is coming. God is coming back. God will always meet the problem. He will never just sweep it under the rug. He'll never avoid it. He'll never just try to hide it or pretend like it doesn't exist. That is not our God. That's you and me, uh, but that is not him. He will always meet the problem head on, specifically in our passage today. He met both problems with a promise, and God will always fulfill his promises, exactly as he said. And so the first promise that we, is, with, that we see is, is Samson was sworn to be born. And God kept his word. And so because of that, you and I can trust that no matter how low the lights dim and no, how, no matter how evil this world gets that we live in, 
our God will come through and our God is coming back to rescue and save and deliver his people from the coming wrath. That is exactly what God is promising through examples like Samson, right? He steps into a very dark situation. God shows up, gives a promise, fulfills his promises. That's what we see in Samson's life. And so Samson was sworn to be born. Number two, Samson was set apart to live. His life was to be a a direct contrast to everyone else. It was supposed to be uh, something set apart from the lives of other people around him. Judges chapter 13, verse 5, No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Verse 7. Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, so then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Samson was to be completely set apart. He was to be a Nazarite. Maybe asking, well, what is a Nazarite? What does that mean? Well, a Nazarite was an Israelite under a vow to specifically be set apart in service to God. Now, Samson's life was a little bit different because Samson did not make to this vow. This, this vow was made for him. So God actually made, uh, God just set him apart from before he was even conceived. I'm going to give you a son. He's going to be a Nazarite, basically from conception, until the day of his death. And so ultimately, though, basically what it meant was an Israelite, they would normally come to the priest. They, they do the sacrifice, the offering, whatever it might be. But they vow to the Lord, I'm consecrating myself specifically to the Lord for a specific purpose or for a specific task. I'm setting myself apart. So I will not be near anything unclean. I will devote my full attention to the Lord for a specific time. They would fulfill the normal time or or however long they have designated for their lives. Um, And then they would come to the priest. They They would kind of finish that out with the sacrifice and everything. But Samson was to be a Nazarite from the womb all the way to death. So his entire life, his entire existence was in service to God. They could not drink alcohol or consume anything from the vine. Couldn't even eat a grape. Like you could not even eat a grape leaf. Like nothing from the vine. You cannot do this. And all of this is found in Numbers chapter 6. Could not drink alcohol or consume anything from the vine. They could not cut their hair. This was very important, could not cut their hair. It's very important, especially for uh, Samson, because we know that ultimately he falls into an immoral relationship and Delilah ends up cutting his hair off and then his strength leaves him. So this is important for, for the account of Samson, but they could not cut their hair. They had to just let it grow out during the whole vow of, of being a Nazarite. So for Samson, that would be his whole life. And they could not go near any dead body. Did it mean if it did it matter if it was uh, a dead body of an animal, dead body of a human, dead body? It doesn't matter. Do not go near a dead body; otherwise, you will be unclean, ceremonially unclean, and there's, that's actually a sin because you've broken your vow. Now, if someone had died next to you, you can't help that, but that would be an unintentional sin. So there were specific sacrifices that they would have to perform because they were under a vow. They were under specifically the Nazarite vow. They were to be completely set apart, completely different, kind of like us. None of us have taken a Nazarite vow, but all of us as Christians, we are to be completely set apart from the rest of the world, not like the people outside, not like the people of this world. We're to be completely distinct, completely set apart. Samson was called to live a life that was set apart from everyone else and everything else, and yet Samson broke all three of these rules, broke them all. This is a guy, again, not someone that you and I want to model our lives after. Samson was quite literally the worst Nazarite Israel had ever seen. Now, I want you to, like, remember that. As you, like, get into God's Word, you get in the Judges chapters 13 through 16, he literally was the worst Nazarite Israel had ever seen. And yet, and this is the key, key word here, key word, yet, God still chose to use him to temporarily rescue Israel from a national foe while ultimately pointing us forward to someone so much greater who would redeem God's people from an eternal fate. All right, so Samson 
was this guy that God had promised, that God had brought on the scene. He gave Manoah and his wife a son. Samson was raised up. Samson became a judge for Israel. Samson became uh, this guy that God was using, even in spite of all of his sin and all of his immoral behavior and leaving the Lord and doing his own thing and being selfish and, and abusive and, and all of these different uh, sins that you could point out in his life, God still chose to use him. God still chose to work through him. And so Samson's entire existence is ultimately meant to direct our focus to the ultimate son of strength, the one who will be so much stronger than even Samson was. That's the Lord Jesus. And so if God did not give him supernatural, physical strength, we would not be referring to him as the son of strength, but the son of weakness. That is how we would be referring to Samson if he did not have supernatural physical strength. But again, his entire life meant to point us towards someone better, the Lord Jesus. There is not only a much greater son that God will give, but there is a far greater problem and an enemy that God will have to face. And so that is what we, we're gonna, we see basically in the account of Samson. Ultimately, Samson was raised up as this very strong person. He's going to face this very strong enemy. But he ultimately couldn't measure up. He couldn't even finish the job. He's just going to begin to save Israel from the enemy at hand. What we're going to see in the long run through the Lord Jesus is that God's going to raise up a much stronger uh, Savior, and he's going to face a much stronger enemy, which will ultimately be Satan, sin, and death. And Jesus will conquer all three of them. Um, but ultimately, again, Samson is pointing us, just like Isaac, pointing us to the, the true son of sacrifice. Samson is pointing us to the true son of strength. And this is what his life tells us. Samson was physically strong, but he was sport, spiritually and morally weak. This is, this is what we see in Judges chapters 13 through 16. Samson was physically strong, but he was spiritually and morally weak. He was a man of tremendous strength. He beat all the men at arm wrestling competitions. He outlifted every heavyweight champion. He killed the lion with his bare hands. Like I, and then he, he, he tore it in half. Like I, can't even ima- I, can, I don't think I could tear this shirt if I tried. And I don't want to embarrass myself, so I'm not going to try. And Caitlin would probably be upset with me. But the point is, I don't think I could tear this shirt. Samson tore, like, grabbed a lion and actually ripped it in two. Like, I mean, think about how strong this individual is, and yet when it came to the temptations to sin, he succumbed every single time, which just showed us that Samson was indeed called by God. He was set apart to live, but Samson was not the ultimate promised son that God had promised Adam and Eve he would one day send. He was not able to be that serpent crusher type promised son that God had originally promised. So we kind of get into the kings in Israel, and we know that God, God is going to raise up a godly king who will rule and reign forever and ever on the throne of David. And so each successive king, we kind of get to this point, it's like when um, in the garden, so I'll come back to the kings for a second, but in the garden, um, Adam and Eve sinned, God came to them, he cursed the serpent. He's like, you guys got to leave. I'm going to clothe you. I'm going to protect you. Ultimately, one day I'm going to send you the serpent crusher. I'm going to send you someone who will come and save you. And Eve kind of thinks, it, it looks like in the text, Eve kind of thinks Cain, her very firstborn son, is, is that guy. I mean, I, I had a baby. And then what happens? Cain murders his brother. So well, Cain's not qualified to be that savior. He's not qualified to be the serpent crusher. So we start looking through different people throughout human history. Specifically now, we get into Israel with the kings. Each king would rise to the throne. And it looks like, I mean, some kings were just evil from the very start. So you just kind of knew they're not, that's not the guy. Um, but some kings like Josiah, oh, he is an amazing king. And then what do we see? We see, we see a heart problem. We see a pride problem. We see sin come into the king's life, and we see, okay, that's obviously not the guy either. The same thing is happening with Samson. Samson is, it was dedicated to God from before he was even born. Hey, before, you're, you're going to have a son. Uh, you're going to name him Samson. He's going to begin to save my people. Like, this is someone that, that everyone in the town would look up to. Like, wow, Sam, like God came to Noah and his wife, promised a son, 
that they're going to have this son. He's going to be doing to save his people from this great and powerful enemy, the Philistines. This must be the guy, the savior that we've been waiting for. And then we see Samson's life is just uh, completely anti-God in most cases. So we obviously know then he's not that ultimate true son of strength that we're waiting for. And so we don't just need a physical muscle here. We need a spiritual rock. When Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was just baptized by John. The spirit of the Lord descended down upon him. It was kind of a public event. God had said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And, and uh, then the spirit of God led him into the wilderness for one purpose. One purpose in Matthew chapter 4 was to be tempted by the devil. So all of these temptations are going to come at him. Temptations that you and I face on a daily basis. Temptations of immorality. Temptations of, uh, are we going to trust the Lord in, in, in work and in how he will provide? Are we going to trust the Lord in this? Am I just going to do my own thing? Am I going to pre, um, am I going to try to uh, put myself over God and, and challenge him? Basically force his hand in certain areas of my life to come through. These were temptations that Satan brought to Jesus, and yet Jesus, complete opposite of Samson. Jesus succeeded at every twist and turn. Jesus did not succumb to any type of temptation that the devil brought against him, which just shows us that Jesus is that ultimate true son of strength that Samson is pointing forward to. And so again, we don't just need a physical muscle, we need a spiritual rock. That is the Lord Jesus. Samson began to save Israel, but even his great strength wasn't enough. And I want you to think about that in connection with our salvation. The strongest man to ever exist was unable to bring about a full and final salvation for God's people. This is the strongest man to ever exist that we're talking about. He was unable to do this. He was not strong enough to finish the job. So why would we, each and every one of us here, people outside of this church and other churches, just people outside who don't go to church, people all over the world, why would we, who are so much weaker than Sam, none of us can tear a li- kill a lion first, just with our bare hands, and then tear it in two pieces, why would we foolishly believe that we could ever rely on our own strength? The reason why we know about Samson today is not because of what Samson did, but because of what God did in and through and on behalf of Samson. God is the one who is the true, uh, Jesus is the one who is the true son of strength. God is the one who worked in and through Samson. We only know about Samson because God chose to use him. We don't know about him because, or we wouldn't know about him if it wasn't for God's power uh, working in and through him. And so it would be foolish of us to try to think that we could just work out our own salvation or that we could just somehow conjure up favor with God, it's not going to happen. You and I cannot work hard enough. We cannot do enough good things. Uh, We cannot be a good enough or nice enough or kind enough person to earn God's favor or, or to measure up to godliness to be able to get to heaven. You and I cannot do that. Samson couldn't do that. He couldn't bring salvation to Israel. And so none of us can do that either. Ultimately, we need someone else who Samson is looking ahead to, we need someone else to come into our lives to save us. And so what we see here is Samson was sworn to be born. God gave that promise specifically to Manoah and his wife. Samson was set apart to live. God had, had designated Samson for a specific purpose throughout his whole, his whole life was meant to be separate and distinct from everyone and everything else. It's not how he lived, but that is how he was supposed to live. Samson was set apart to live. God had called this man to something very specific, and his life was meant to parallel and foreshadow Christ. He was called to point us to the true son of strength. So there were supposed to be areas of his life in which he did parallel the true son of strength. I mean, Samson was incredibly strong. He began to save God's people from the Philistines. He couldn't finish the job. There was an enemy uh, that he, he at least began to do that. Well, Jesus would come in, and Jesus would actually finish the job. Jesus would ultimately destroy all of God's enemies. Jesus would be the true son of strength. There are parallels that we can pull out from Samson to Jesus and how they kind of parallel one another. But Samson was also to act as a contrast 
a foil or a juxtaposition, just something completely different, just the complete opposite in connection with Christ. So he's meant to parallel him in some regards, but also act as a contrast, black and white, like, you know, they're not the same, they're complete opposites, day and night. Samson was to act as a contrast in connection with Christ. His life emphasized that whoever God's Messiah will be, he will be so much better and so much stronger than Samson ever could be. He will be the true son of strength. This is, this is what we see in Samson's life. He's meant to parallel and foreshadow the one who will come, but also act as a contrast. Samson was this completely immoral person. Jesus was the exact opposite. Jesus was perfectly moral, perfectly right, perfectly holy, perfectly good, perfectly he obeyed God's law in its entirety, never once broke it, not even unintentionally, not even unknowingly. He always measured up to God's law and God's standard absolutely perfectly. So Samson is the complete opposite of what we see here. So Samson, sworn to be born, he's the promised son that we're talking about today. He was set apart to live, and Samson finally was surrendered up to death. And the day of his death is one of the few times that we see Samson actually seek to the Lord, and it presents us with an interesting take on how exactly his death foreshadows the coming of the Lord Jesus. It's after his immoral relationship with Delilah goes south. She has all of his hair cut off. She ties him and binds his hands. The Philistines come in and take him away. They gouge out his eyes, and he is made the laughingstock of the enemy nation. Philistines use him as kind of like one of those you see in some older movies about a king who's on his throne and in the court of the, the palace. They have the royal fool and someone who is just basically there to entertain, uh, entertain the king and the guests and the, the different lords that, that come for parties. They, they did that to Samson. I mean, they gouged out his eyes. He was no longer physically strong anymore. He was a, probably a big dude. He just wasn't strong enough to do anything against them. And so they just used him as, for entertainment purposes, kind of tied him up like an animal here, made fun of him, made him a mockery. Judges chapters, uh, chapter 16, verse 28 says, Then Samson, this is after they tied him up, they brought him in for entertainment purposes. He's all chained up. And he asked the guy, hey, can you just put me next to the two middle pillars in the house? There are thousands of people that have gathered together in this house, in the balcony, on the roof. This is a big palace here that he's in at this point. And Samson, standing by the pillars, he says, called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O oh God that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. There came a point in Samson's life when he willingly laid down his life to destroy God's enemies. And I want you to think about that in connection with Jesus. Again, there are parallels in, in Samson's life that kind of foreshadow the coming of the promised son. Samson was put to open shame. So this is kind of referring to his death. Samson was put to open shame. Jesus also was put to open shame. Samson ended his life in prayer. Jesus ended his life in prayer. Samson gave up his life to defeat God's enemies. That's what he did. He gave up his life to defeat God's enemies. Jesus also did the very same thing. Jesus gave up his life to defeat God's enemies. Samson put all of God's enemies to public shame. He actually turned their shame against them. Now every one of the Philistines are kind of a laughing stock. You lost to this guy. Well, Jesus did the same thing, whereas they had first put him to open shame, he turns it back on their heads, put all of God's enemies to public shame. Uh, the book of Colossians in chapter 2, verse 15 says, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So kind of think about this, like, how on earth is dying on a cross 
being publicly humiliated, how does that, how does that win against, uh, you, you think about it from Satan's perspective, probably did not see this coming. Now, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, I don't know. I don't know exactly what he was thinking. Um, but Jesus actually used something that none of us, especially the Jewish people, they didn't, they didn't have a clue as to, you, you can look in the gospel accounts, and there's the lady who right at the end, uh, I think it's Mary, she anoints Jesus' feet for burial. She gets it. None of the disciples got it. No one else knew that Jesus, as the Messiah, was supposed to give his life as a ransom for the rest of the world. So, so barely anybody even had uh, a clue as to what was going on. But Jesus' death and his resurrection actually was used by God to disarm the rulers and authorities, Satan and his minions, all the demonic forces, put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So now death literally has no hold over any single person. Death has no hold. Satan has no power. Like you and I, as Christians, we're not with, we're still living in Satan's kingdom, and it's still under the umbrella of God's sovereignty. Satan is still kind of the god of this, the little g, god of this world. He still has a little bit of power uh, that God allows for him. But he does not rule over our lives. He cannot control any, any aspect of who we are. He can influence us, but ultimately us giving in would be, would be allowing him that influence. But we do not have, have to give in to sin. Sin, death, Satan, they've all lost their ultimate power over our lives. Jesus completely disarmed the rulers and authorities, all of God's enemies. He completely had victory over each and every one of them. And we know from our vantage point that Samson and others like him only began to save Israel. So other judges, uh, Joshua, who we've been going through, Moses, you could think of any king or any fearless leader that, that God had raised up in the past. They're kind of like Samson. They only began to save Israel from, from these minor temporary enemies that, that ultimately were not the real enemy. Jesus had to come to deal with the real enemy. But they only began to save Israel. They never actually finished the job. But one thing we know is that when Jesus was on the cross, one of his very last statements that he made while he was hanging there was the famous line, It is finished. It is finished. God actually finished the job. See, he didn't, Jesus, as the true son of strength, he didn't begin to save Israel. He fully and finally saved Israel. He fully and finally saved his people. And so Samson was just beginning to save Israel. But, but Jesus came in, he finished the job. He did all of it. And so ultimately what we have here is a picture, just like Isaac, his whole sacrifice, that, that sacrifice that God had called Abraham to sacrifice his son, that was pointing us forward to this coming sacrifice, this true sacrifice, who God would not stop Rome from, from basically uh, throwing the knife. You know, they were going to crucify him. God stopped Abraham from doing that. But he was pointing forward to there's going to be a substitute. There's going to be someone who I will not stop. They will actually kill him on Mount Moriah, the same mountain that Abraham offered Isaac. So what we have here is a picture of Isaac pointing forward to the Lord Jesus. Again, all of these promised sons in Scripture point forward to the ultimate promised son. That is God's great narrative throughout human history. He's pointing forward. So Samson is the same way. We have a promised son here. He's pointing forward to someone who's so much, so much stronger, so much better. And Jesus said, it is finished. Job is complete. The true son of sacrifice and the true son of strength came and conquered every foe that had risen up against God's people. Jesus is the ultimate promised son that Isaac and Samson pointed forward to. He is the son of sacrifice. He's the true son of strength. Jesus is the son of salvation. This is, who we, this is who we talk about every week. This is who we worship every week. Jesus is that promised son. And we see in the book of Isaiah, I'm going to give you a son. I'm, I'm, there, a child will be born. A son will be given. We're getting into who exactly Jesus is. Jesus is the one that, from the very beginning, after Adam and Eve had sinned, back in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will give you offspring, and this, this descendant of yours, he is going to come, and he is going to crush the head of the serpent. This is the one right here, the Lord Jesus, this is the one that we 
and all of human history have been waiting for the son of salvation, who perfectly emphasizes the son of strength, the son of sacrifice, and next week we'll talk about the son of service. But Jesus, being the ultimate son of strength, tells us two main things. Number one, he is the reason for our salvation. So he is the, the strong one in the equation. He is the one who brought it about, and he continues to save. So he's the one who's doing the work. Again, like none of us can work hard enough. There's nothing that I can do to save myself from sin or from, from Satan, from death. Like I can't, I can eat healthier and I can work out and I can, you know, you can do all those things. Eventually we're all going to die, all right? So death is just an enemy that none of us can face. There's nothing that we can do, even though there are some billionaires right now that are trying to, I guess, freeze themselves so that they can then wake up hundreds of years from now and, and they'll revive them and they'll have found a cure to death. They're never going to find a cure to death. You know, the only cure is in Jesus. Uh, but there's nothing we can do to defeat that. Well, Satan is kind of like that. Satan is an invisible enemy. You know, at least when we fight other nations or when we fight in wars, like we can at least see the enemy. We can evaluate their plans. We can, I don't know, but, but we can't do that with Satan. We can't see him. We don't even know where he is. We, we, we don't even know what weapons they use. It talks about in Daniel how the angel, Daniel prayed, and then this angel was coming to answer the prayer, and, but he was held up by another angel for like 21 days. And I've always thought, like, what does that look like? I'm thinking like a Dragon Ball Z type of uh, warfare going. I don't, I don't know what that means for an angel to have war with another angel because they can't, they can't die. So I don't know what that looks like. We don't have any idea what their weapons look like ultimately. We can't fight against this enemy. So Satan, sin, death, sin just has power over our lives. None of us can defeat any of these enemies. The same with Samson. We are not strong enough to do this. Jesus is the one, the son of strength, who comes in and he binds the strong man. All right, going back to the gospel accounts, Jesus is the one who binds the strong man. He comes into the house, he ties him up, and he allows us to be free. But he is also the one who will protect us from the enemy. Because even though Satan, sin, and death are all defeated foes, their mess has not been fully cleaned up yet. Like, we're still dealing with the effects and the stench of, of their carcasses. And I was having a conversation uh, this week with somebody, and we were talking about well, this person uh, talked about how he believes there, there's demons in, in his house and, and tormenting him. And so it was, it was an interesting conversation, but we talked about, like, different— he, he, he wanted to know different methods that, that he could use. And um, I told him, ultimately, you can't—there's nothing that you and I can do. There, 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 there's, there's no amount of herbs or, or sage or, or whatever it might be, salt lines. Like, we see those in, in TV shows like Supernatural, and, 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 and I know different uh, denominations and, and different religious groups will try to practice some of those things. There is literally nothing that you and I can do to fight against Satan on our own. We just can't do it. We don't have the tools necessary. So I, he, he, was a, he was a veteran. He he had been over in Afghanistan, and I talked to him. I was like, hey, so think about it this way. Pretend you're over there in Afghanistan, and they have their weapons, their guns, and, and all that, and you have a dandelion. Like, how do you think you're going to, uh, are you going to be effective? Well, the answer is no. He's not going to be effective at all, because you're fighting them with a dandelion, you know, whereas they have actual weapons of warfare. There's nothing that you and I can do. And so what we need is, is, is not all of these external pra practices or whatever it might be. We need the Lord Jesus to come in and save us. And that is, what, that is why it is so important for us to not only admit that we're sinners, to believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and he's done what he said he, he did. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose again. But it's important for us to confess him publicly as Lord. Because not only does that mean that he's our master, he owns us. He can do with us as he pleases. He can lead us wherever he wants. He guides our life. That means that, like, I am not the captain of my ship. He's the captain of my ship. But it also means that he is going to protect everything that he owns with all of his strength. 
he is going to, I mean, I mean, you, I, there are things uh, at our house or things that we own that I will absolutely protect because I own it. It's mine. You know, like you're the same way. There are valuable things or valuable people, family members, like you're going to give your life for even. You're going to protect. If, if I asked you, there's, the fire alarm goes off in the middle of the night. What are you grabbing? You know, there, there's something that Caitlin and I have in our mind that we're grabbing that. You know, we're making sure we have it. It's, it's, a, it's a value. It's of extreme importance. You guys have the same thing. Well, think about someone who is the Lord of our lives. He owns us. All right? He's grabbing us from that fire. He's going to rescue us. He's going to do everything that he can as the son of strength, the perfect son of strength, to save everyone and everything that belongs to him. That is also what it means to, to publicly confess him and acknowledge him as our Lord. He is not just our Savior, but he is also our Lord. And so our job, not to try to be the victorious one um, or victorious in our own strength, we can't do it. We're kind of like Samson, Samson's strongest man physically ever to live, uh, but He's not strong enough, very weak individual when it came to spiritually, morally speaking. We need Christ. Being the son of strength and savior is ultimately his role. And so and this, is, this is who Jesus is. He is the true son of sacrifice. He is the son of strength. He is the son of salvation. This is the guy that we're looking ahead to through all of these different promised sons throughout the Bible. We're always looking ahead to one specific person. It's what the whole Bible centers upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that everything from beginning to end, Genesis 1 on through Revelation 22, whatever the last verse is. I can't remember off the top of my head. Like, it's all pointing directly to one person. He is the central theme of the entire Bible. And so if you not yet trusted in this, this Jesus, the son of strength, the son of sacrifice, the son of salvation, this is your day. All right, and, and he's made it incredibly easy. All right, again, if, if God desires to use Samson, literally the worst Nazarite in all of Israel history, he desires to use you. If he wants to bless Samson, he wants to bless you. He wants to save you, especially because he wanted to save Samson, and he included Samson in the faith chapter. And so for all of us here, everyone who's not a Christian yet, there are three things that you have to do. There are Number one is, we're going through the ABCs here. A, you have to admit that you are a sinner. You have to admit that you cannot save yourself. You are evil at your core. You deserve God's wrath. You deserve punishment. You are a sinner. There are sins that you have committed. You do not align perfectly with God's law or God's standard. You have to admit that humbly before him. B is believe. You have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for your sins and rose again and is offering you life just by trusting him, believing him. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So you have to admit that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus is your savior. He died for you on the cross and rose again and you have to confess him as Lord publicly. Acknowledge him before men and he says he will acknowledge you before his father in heaven. That is what you have to do. Admit that you're a sinner, believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again and confess him as Lord. And so uh, I want to encourage you to do that today. But if you are a Christian here, which I, I believe most of us are, um, but if you're a Christian here, and, and, and again, Satan ultimately has no power over us. Sin has no control over us. Not like an unbeliever. Unbeliever, they don't do anything in faith. So everything that they do is ultimately sin because they're not doing it to please God. And so, um, but none of that stuff has power over us. But at times we allow sin and Satan to influence our lives, uh, ultimately for the worse. We allow sin to come into our lives, temptations to overwhelm us. If you are a Christian here and you have been allowing um, sin to come in, like this is also an opportunity for you to, to repent, to turn from that sin, to say, Jesus, I am not strong enough to overcome in this area. Sin on its own is just wrecking my life. It's overcoming me. It's filling me up. And I need your salvation. I need you as the, the true son of strength to help me, to save me. As the Lord of my life, I need you to come in and to save 
what belongs to you specifically. And so I, let's go ahead and pray. If, if you are not a Christian, uh, man, pr- pray the prayer of salvation. Cry out to the Lord. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. And confess him as Lord. But if you're, if you're a Christian, um, even if you're not it, being overwhelmed or consumed with sin uh, lately or as of right now, hey, we all go through seasons and, and we all struggle. And, and so just pray for the son of strength to, 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 to keep you on the right track, to, to help you to, to stand strong when temptation does come. God, we pray that you would bless us as your people. I pray for anyone here who's not a Christian yet, who's not saved. Father, I pray that, um, God, you would save them, that you would rescue them from their sins. I pray that they would admit exactly who they are and that they are in need of a Savior. They are in need of you, the Son of Salvation who is the perfect sacrifice, the perfect true son of strength and, and the son of service. Uh, Father, I pray that they would uh, surrender their lives to you as, as these sons did. Um, and Father, I pray for all of us here who are believers that we would continue to, to walk with you in the light. I pray that each and every one of us, Father, that your Holy Spirit would fill us and empower us to be the the people of God that you've called us to be. I pray, God, that you would free us from the enemy's hand and the enemy's grasp. Father, you've already conquered all the enemies that we will ever face, but sometimes we allow the enemy to creep into our lives. We allow weeds to grow up, and and Father, we need you as the great gardener to come in and, and to root out all the weeds. We need you to help us, to save us, to sustain us. God, you are the son of strength. We, in and of ourselves, are not strong enough. God, we're just like Samson. We live immoral lives at times. We, we walk away from you. We're like Israel. We, we forsake the Lord. God, we need you to come through, not just in our society, but in our individual lives. We need you to come through. Send your Savior. Send your salvation. Father, protect us. God, you own us. You are our master and our Lord. And so, Father, we're praying. Lord Jesus, son of strength, that you would come in, that you would work powerfully in our lives, that you would make us to be the, the godly, set-apart, Nazarite-type people that you have called us to be, completely separate from the rest of the world. Father, help us to live the lives that you have called us to be. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you so much in your name. Amen.